in light of what occurred last Sunday, I think it would be appropriate for us uh, at this point in time to take a few moments and pray for those who were impacted by the storms of last week. Many people were impacted in a variety of ways. Some families lost family members. Others had extensive damage to homes and property. And so uh, if you would, please, we're going to take just a few moments here just to pray uh, silently for those who were impacted by the storms. Uh, and then I'll close us in prayer. Would you do that, please? Let's pray silently and then I'll close us. Lord Jesus, we're now asking that you continue to minister to those who are still recovering from the storms of last week. Lord, we know full well that there are some who are still trying to put things back together, and whether it's homes or families. Lord, we're, we're grateful for your unchanging hand that continues to administer grace and mercy even in times like these. Lord, we're also thankful for those who were so quick to respond and there were many from this church who ministered to not only members of this church, but people outside of this church in a variety of communities. Lord, uh, help us to be uh, ready and quick and able to be your hands and feet and to be your agents of mercy for those who are in need. Lord, help us also to be quick to see individuals as human beings, as people created in your image, as Kevin reminded us. Lord, help us to see that people are not only created in your image, but people that you died for, and that we should be very quick and willing to lend assistance. Lord, for those who are still struggling, we, we ask, Lord, that our efforts be sustained. Help us, Lord, not to do it just in the heat of the battle and then forget. Help us to see this thing through. And we ask all of this, Lord, in your name. Amen. We well, you know uh, recently here, um, our, our culture has coined a new phrase. I don't, I don't know if you've recognized that or not, but we have. And when I say it, you'll recognize it. The new phrase is fake news. Did you realize that we've, uh, we've coined that new phrase? You, you've been hearing a lot about fake news here lately, haven't you? You know, it's, it's a new phrase, I guess, but you know, fake news hasn't been, I mean, that's not new. Fake news has been around for a, a long time. Just ask Adam and Eve. Um, and I'll let you think about that one. Um, um, but, uh, you know, <clears throat> and if you're not familiar with fake news and what that means, it, it simply means, you know, something is being uh, reported as true when it's not. Now, uh, here's the really bad thing about fake news. Uh, the bad thing about fake news is that those who are saying this is true don't take the time to verify whether or not it's true or not. They just say it's, it's true and they just put it out there. And that's, that's the really bad part about fake news. And, and the other bad thing about fake news is once it's out there, it's awfully hard to correct it. You know, uh, that, that's the other bad thing about fake news. Uh, it's uh, something that uh, we're going to continue to have to struggle with, I think, within our culture here for a long time. But, you know, we don't want there to be any fake news associated with our Bridge to Tomorrow campaign. We're in the last Sunday of our communication phase here of our Bridge to Tomorrow campaign. And you know that that's our campaign to raise funds, to build a facility, to begin an outdoor recreational facility, to use that to bring lost people into the kingdom. It's going to be a means by which we will invite lost people to be a part of these recreational opportunities and in the midst of those opportunities present the gospel to them so that they can come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And uh, we've uh, uh, been asking you to consider uh, how much you're going to give to that. And, and uh, you see over here we have uh, uh, the principle that we're using here, not equal gifts but equal sacrifices. We're not asking everyone to give the same amount, but we are asking everyone to consider what might be a sacrificial gift on your part and on my part. Now, we also got our thermometer here, and that kind of helps us to understand where we are in our giving. And you see there's some different levels there, and how much we give will dictate how much we're going to be able to do. 
And obviously, if we are able to raise the entire amount of $2.5 million, we'll be able to do both the outdoor recreation uh, and the family life center. And I realize some of us may be saying, well, now, you know, if we do that, isn't, you know, $2.5 million, that's a lot of money. And the question may come up, are we going to be, are we being good stewards by spending that much money, $2.5 million? Are we being good stewards? Well, this morning's sermon is titled, Debunking the Fake News About Stewardship. And it's based upon Matthew, the 25th chapter, verses 14 through 30. If you've got your Bibles, you'll need to open to that passage of Scripture. We're going to be looking at it very closely here in the next few moments. So you'll need to have your Bible open to that passage of Scripture. Now, while you're turning there, let me just go ahead and put it in a nutshell what the fake news of stewardship is all about. Okay, here it is. I'm going to go ahead and give it to you. Uh, the fake news of stewardship has existed for years. Uh, it, it has uh, integrated itself in churches uh, all over our country. Here it is. Here's the fake news of stewardship. You ready? Here it is. A good steward means you don't spend money unless you absolutely have to, unless it's an emergency. That's the definition of being a good steward. Folks, that's fake news. Now, listen, for me personally, in my home, and how I kind of do my own personal finances, I kind of like the way that sounds. I don't want to spend money unless it's absolutely necessary. For my own home, that's, I, I kind of like that. But that is not the definition for a biblical understanding of stewardship. Being a good steward is not you only spend money unless you absolutely have to. Uh, I'm going to put this up on the screen for us. A very simple definition of stewardship, and we're going to put it up here so you can see it, is this. Stewardship is the proper management of valuable items that belong to someone else. Did you catch that last part? Stewardship is the proper management of valuable items that belong to someone else. That's what stewardship is. So you can already see that we've got some debunking to do. Now, that's a good definition. It's a very simple definition. But, you know, Jesus isn't just satisfied with giving us a definition. I love the fact that Jesus many times illustrates truth for us. Because, you know, a story will stick in your head a whole lot better than a definition. And so what does Jesus do for us in this area? He gives us a story. He gives us an illustration. And we find it there in that passage of Scripture that we just listed there for you. Matthew, the 25th chapter, verses 14 through 30. Just follow along as I read here this parable of the talents. This is Matthew 25, beginning at verse 14. Now, let me set the stage for you real quick here, too. Let, let me read verse 13, all right? Look, look at verse 13. This is Jesus speaking, and he says, Therefore, be alert, because you don't know either the day or the hour. Now, what's he referring to there? You don't know the day or the hour. The day or the hour of what? The day or the hour of his return. Everybody with me? We don't know when Jesus is going to return, right? So, Jesus is saying, be alert. You don't know the day or the hour. And then he gives this parable. So, what's he saying? He's saying, so in the meantime, until I come back, this is how you should act. This is how you should conduct your life. How should we conduct our life? Listen to this parable. For it is like, just like a man going on a journey. He called his own slaves and turned over his possessions to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to each according to his own ability. Then he went on a journey. Immediately the man who had received five talents went, put them to work, and earned five more. In the same way, the man with two earned two more. But the man who had received one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five talents approached, presented five more talents, and said, Master, you gave me five talents. Look, I've earned five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful over a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Share your master's joy. Then the man with two talents also approached. He said, Master, you gave me two talents. Look, I've earned two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful slave. You are faithful over a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Share your master's joy. 
Then the man who had received one talent also approached and said, Master, I know you. You're a difficult man, reaping where you haven't sown and gathering where you haven't scattered seed. So I was afraid and went off and hid your talent in the ground. Look, you have what is yours. But his master replied to him, You evil, lazy slave. If you knew that I reap where I haven't sown and gather where I haven't scattered, then you should have deposited my money with the bankers. And when I returned, I would have received my money back with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one who has ten talents. For to everyone who has more will be given, and he will have more than enough. But from, but from the one... Excuse me, but from the one who does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. And throw this good-for-nothing slave into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, folks, there's a lot we can pull out of that parable there. But I'm uh, going to be very selective and just pull out three principles that basically debunk this fake news about stewardship. That being a good steward means you don't spend money unless you absolutely have to. And here's the first principle that really debunks that whole idea. Here it is. God owns everything. Now listen, folks. That debunks this whole idea that being a good steward means you don't spend money unless you absolutely have to. Because many times we treat God's property as if it's ours. It's not ours. God owns everything. Let's make sure we get this clear in our mind. Look at verses 14 and the first part of verse 15. It says, For it is just like a man going on a, slur on a journey. He called his own slaves and turned over his possessions to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one. Now, let's make sure we've got that. It doesn't say that his possessions became theirs. It says he turned them over to them. Let's also understand that as we get to the end of the story, what does he do? He comes back and says, What did you do with my stuff? Right? So he doesn't give them those things and say, now they're yours. He still retains the ownership. And that's the important thing to see there. Now, what did he give them? It says talents. And folks, to keep it in context here, most likely it's talents of silver. Okay? And we'll talk more about that in just a few moments. So this is what I want to make sure that you see. The slaves possessed the talents, but the master still owned them. The slaves were given the responsibility to manage the talents, but the master still retained the rights to those resources. Everybody with me? Now, folks, it's still true today. God owns everything. Now, if we want to, we can exhaust our energies and going through different parts of the Bible and see all kind of verses where it just makes it plain. God owns, you know, the cattle on a thousand hills and all that kind of thing. God owns everything. Listen. I've done a bunch of funerals since I've been here in the six years I've been here. I've not yet seen the hearse pull away with a U-Haul behind it. That There aren't luggage, luggage racks up on the, on the hearse. You came into this world with nothing, you're going to leave with nothing. I mean, that's just the way it is, folks. We don't own anything. Now, I understand that you're sitting there and saying, but, you know, the bank says I own it. And I, I had to convince the bank that I could own it. And I paid the bank an awful lot of money to convince the bank that I do own it. But listen. Let's just make it black and white. Do you understand your world from a worldly perspective or from a Christian perspective? Well, if you're a Christian, it better be from a Christian perspective. And what does the Bible say? The Bible says that as Christians, we don't own anything. The Bible says we are good stewards, though, or we are to be good stewards... Of all that God has given to us. So we're in the same boat here as this parable. God has given us things, but we don't own them. He still retains the rights to them. But he's given us those things so that we will manage them correctly, properly. Now, folks, that's true for you and me as individuals. And it's also true for this church. Listen, folks. It's, it's, it's common for us as members of this church to say, well, this is my church. I belong to this church. And, I, you know, my church is doing this. My church is doing that. I understand that. That's just an easy way of talking about things. But listen, folks, the truth of the matter is you don't own this church. I don't own this church. This church doesn't belong to me. This church belongs to Jesus Christ. Amen. This is his church. 
Now listen, I understand that maybe somebody here can say, but wait a minute, my granddaddy made those doors back there. Or my granddaddy helped make that pew that I'm sitting in. And I understand there's a lot of people in a lot of churches. Listen, that place where they sit on that pew, that's their spot. Don't you dare sit in it. Right? Listen, folks, I was in a church a while back where, you know, a couple came to me after the church. They were upset. Why? Somebody sat in their spot. Listen, that's not your pew. Even if your granddaddy made that pew, it's not your pew. Now, listen, we're talking about material things here. But when we say that Jesus, if this is Jesus' church, are we, when we say that, are we really talking about material things? No. What is the church? Is the church a building or is it people? It's people. So when we say that Jesus owns the church, talk about you and me. And not only that, we're talking about the decisions that you and I make. We're talking about the direction that the church goes. We're talking about the ministries that the church engages in. That's what Jesus Christ owns. That's what he needs to be in charge of. So, folks, if a church has land, if a church has money, guess what? We don't own it. We don't own that land out there. That's not our money sitting in the bank. I know. Somebody back there is saying, well, listen, I put a pretty good amount of that money in that bank. Yeah, you did, but it's not yours. It wasn't yours to begin with. Listen, this whole idea of, look, I know I'm supposed to give God 10% of what he, he's given to me, but I can spend the other 90% any way I want. No, that's not the way it works. Everything we have, God has given it to us. So, God owns everything. Even the resources that we have as a church. And... He should be in charge of whatever direction we're going, whatever decisions we're making. This truth needs to permeate the way we think and the decisions that we make. Now, here's another principle we can pull out of this parable that helps us to debunk this whole idea about fake news regarding stewardship. Here it is. God expects us to invest his resources in the kingdom. He expects us to invest his resources in the kingdom. You, you know, folks, the other thing about the fake news about stewardship that says, you know, um, <clears throat> being a good steward means you don't spend money unless you absolutely have to. The reason that that's fake news about stewardship is because God expects us to take the resources he's given to us and invest them in the kingdom. And in order to do that, we have to spend money. We have to spend resources. We have to utilize those things that he's given us. How do we know that? <clears throat> Here's what I want you to see. Look at the last part of verse 15 and then let's go to verse 18. It says, he gave these talents to each one according to his own ability. Then he went on a journey. Now look at this next word. Immediately, the man who had received five talents went, put them to work and earned five more. In the same way, the man with two earned two more. But the man who had received one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. Now, Jesus goes on with the story there. <clears throat> but this is what I want you to see. Jesus doesn't take any time to explain why the first two servants did what they did. Do you know why? Because everybody understood why the first two servants did what they did. In other words, it was common knowledge in that day and time for these two servants to do exactly what they did. Jesus didn't have to explain it. <clears throat> Everybody understood that in that day and time in the first century, a master would take some trusted slaves and say, I'm getting ready to go on a journey. Here's resources that I have. I can't use them while I'm gone, but you need to use them and continue to make money for me while I'm gone. I can't do it while I'm gone. So while I'm gone, you've got to do it. And when I come back, I'm going to see how well you did. Everybody in the first century understood that. Jesus didn't have to explain it. Everybody understood it. It was common knowledge. I hope you see the application. Should be the same thing for the church. Folks, it's a no-brainer. 
that we as a church should have the same understanding when it comes to the Lord's resources that he has blessed us with. It should be so simple to understand that the resources that he has given to us should be utilized to do one very simple thing, to advance the kingdom. There should be no debate. Folks, there's, it should not be uh, debatable as to what we should do with the resources God has given us. I mean, in the same way that everybody understood that when the master gave the slaves these talents of sil silver, what they should do, we should be the same way. If God has given us resources, there should be no debate. We need to do whatever we can do with those resources to bring lost people into the kingdom of God. Amen? There's no reason to debate that. I mean, if we think we should be doing something else with those resources, then we need to stop being a church. That's what the church is here to do. That's what that slave was there to do. Now, folks, every parable that Jesus gave had a surprise in it. Every one. It had a twist. In every parable that Jesus spoke... There was a part in it when after he said it, everybody, everybody went, oh, what did he say? And verse 18 is where that happened in this parable. Look at verse 18. Jesus said, <clears throat> but the man who had received one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. When the crowd heard that, everybody went, oh. What did he do? You know why they did that? Because everybody knew that that slave had done something foolish. Had done something stupid. Everybody knew that he should have done exactly what the first two had done. That third slave had done something unthinkable. Here's the application, folks. Pretty easy. Folks, it's unthinkable for any church to be blessed with resources and not use them for the kingdom of God. That's just unthinkable. Why in the world would we use anything that God has blessed us with to do anything other but advance the kingdom of God? Pretty simple. Now, I know some people are saying, Brother Robert, you're talking about the kingdom of God. What is the kingdom of God? Let me give you the technical definition, but then we'll break it down into a more applicable kind of thing. The technical definition of the kingdom of God is the rule and reign of God. Wherever you see Jesus in charge, the rule of Jesus, the reign of Jesus, that is the, that, that is the kingdom, okay? That's the technical definition. But let's put it in a more easily swallowable definition. Let's ask a simple question. While Jesus was walking this earth, what would you say was the most important thing to him? Just think about it for a second. What was the most important thing to Jesus as he was walking this earth? You know, if you'll think about it long enough, you'll come to the conclusion that it was lost people. It was lost people. People, for the sake of lost people, that Jesus allowed himself to be arrested. It was for the sake of lost people that Jesus allowed a crown of thorns to be pressed upon his brow. It was for the sake of lost people that he allowed them to make a mockery of him and hit him in the face and spit upon him. It was for the sake of lost people that he allowed them to whip him and rip, the shred, rip his back to shreds. It was for the sake of lost people. That he allowed them to crucify him and to die a humiliating death. It was for the sake of lost people that he did all of those things. And it was for the sake of lost people like you and me. That led Jesus three days later to erupt out of that grave and to say, I have defeated death forever. So folks, when we say... God expects us to invest in the kingdom. It's pretty simple. He expects us to do all we can to help lost people come to know Jesus who died for them. Well, there's one other principle I think we can pull out of this parable. I think that will help debunk the fake news of stewardship. God will audit 
our faithfulness. We see this in verses 19 through 30. And I'm not going to read all of that again. We read that earlier. But, you know, this is another aspect that's important for us to see as far as debunking this fake news of stewardship. You see, one of the things that is a part of that fake news of stewardship that says, you know, don't spend any money unless you absolutely have to. The, the inherent to that idea is, and if we do that, if we don't spend money unless we absolutely have to, God's going to be pleased with our conservativeness. Folks, listen. In this story, God came back and said, what did you do with what I gave you? And we know that at the end of the story, he wasn't pleased with the one who said, I held on to it. God will audit our faithfulness. Look at verse 19. It says, after a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Folks, there's only two reasons for the master to settle accounts. That's number one, that he understands that he still owns the resources. And number two, he expected them to invest it in some kind of way. But the key to this section is in verses 21 and 23. I hope you'll look at verses 21 and 23. They, both, both of those verses are word for word exactly the same. And it's what the master said to the first two slaves. But the phrase that I want you to see there in verse 21 or verse 23 is the phrase that says this, you were faithful. You were faithful. Let's put this in our modern day world. Here's an employer over here. He's got two employees. Entrust them with, to do two different tasks. The first employer come, employee comes back and says, I've increased our portfolio by this much. Five whatever. Five stock items. The other one says, well, I did the same thing, but it only was increased by two stock items. And the employer says, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reward both of you with the same bonus, the same amount of bonus. Don't you imagine that this guy over here that increased it by this much is saying, well, now, wait a minute. I increased it by five. He only increased it by two. I should get a bigger reward. Now, isn't that how our world works today? Yeah, that's how it works. But what did the master in this parable do? Look at verses 21 and 23. The words are exactly the same. Same commendation. Well done, good, faithful servant. What is, and then what does he say? You've been faithful over a few things. Put you in charge of many. Share your master's joy. Exact same wording. Here's the thing. He was rewarding their faithfulness. Not the gain that they gave him. Does everybody see that? I hope you see that. That's really important. He wasn't re rewarding the return that he gave them. He was rewarding their faithfulness. Now, why is this important? For us today, it's important because, as we said earlier, we're currently in the midst of a capital fundraising campaign. We're trying to do what we believe God has asked us to do, to begin a recreational facility, a, a, a ministry with a, with a facility. And you know, folks, if we get the means to build that facility out there and begin that ministry, listen, it's very possible that in the first few months, maybe in the first couple of years, we may not see anyone come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, even though we're doing our best efforts. It may rock on for a couple of years. And we may not see anyone come to know Jesus through those efforts. It will be very tempting for some of us to come to the conclusion, well, you know, building that building out there was a mistake. Listen. Listen carefully. God does not gauge our success or our failure on our returns. He gauges it on our faithfulness. If we're convinced... That God has said, go build that building, begin a recreational ministry, then I believe that's what we need to do. And that is what God is going to be looking at. After all, folks, he simply calls us to be his witnesses. The saving is his business. That's his ministry. So I believe God has given us the resources and he's just watching and waiting to see if we'll be faithful or not. I want to make sure that we put this in a personal way. Listen, God has gifted you in some very specific ways personally. There's some things that God has gifted in you as an individual. 
that he's expecting you to utilize in his kingdom. And, and you know, whether it's a, a talent of playing uh, the piano or singing or maybe managing or any number of things, I hope you understand that, number one, God owned that gift before he gave it to you. Number two, he expects you to invest that in his kingdom. And number three, there's going to come a time when he's going to come to you and say, you know, that ability, that gift that I gave you, what have you done with it? How have you utilized that in glorifying the kingdom? I'd like to end this on a happy note, but you know, Jesus' story doesn't end on a happy note, so therefore I can't. There's the matter of the evil, lazy slave. Again, I'm not going to read all of that, but you heard what happened. What he had was taken away from him, and then he was cast out into the outer darkness. Folks, I'm not going to elaborate on a lot of that, but I want to point out something that may not jump out at you, but I think it's really important. The first two slaves, they did exactly what the master asked him to do, or what the master expected. But the third one didn't. Do you remember how the third one described the master? Do you remember that? Let's go back to that real quickly. Look at verse 24. This is what the slave, the third slave, said about the master. He said, Master, I know you. You're a difficult man, reaping where you haven't sown and gathering where you haven't scattered seed. Now, let's not kid ourselves, folks. This parable is about God and us, right? Who's the master? God, Jesus, right? Who are the slaves? You and me. What kind of attitude did this slave have towards God? Not a good one. His attitude towards the master was a bad one. A difficult man. One who reaped where he didn't sow. Gathered where he'd not scattered seed. Look, folks, I think that's an improper view of God. Let me just say this. I know this is just a parable, but I think the lesson learned here is that if our love for Jesus is correct, if we love him, we will obey him. I think the lesson to be learned about that third slave is that he didn't love the master. He had an incorrect view of the master. And that's what led him to disobedience and all the excuses that he made. But if we love Jesus, obedience shouldn't be that difficult. Well, church, I'm going to ask you a foolish question. I'll go ahead and admit it. There's really only two types of slaves or servants here. The first two are of the same type. The first two, they were the obedient type. The the second type, that's the third slave, the one who was disobedient and cast out into the outer darkness. Here's the foolish question. Church, this is for the entire church. Of the two types of servants, the ones who were obedient and rewarded, or the one who was disobedient and cast out, which do you want to be? I told you it was foolish. Because every one of us in here should be saying, I want this church to be like the first servant. Every one of us should be saying that. You know what that means? That means we've got to give up ownership of some things. We've got to allow the truth that God owns everything to permeate the decisions that we make. It also means that we've got to be ready to invest in things that will cause the kingdom to advance. And push back the darkness of sin. It also means that we need to be prepared for that day when Jesus will say to us, just exactly what did you do with the resources that I gave you? Did you invest them or did you hold on to them? You know, folks, the difference between the first two slaves and the last one really is just one simple thing. Love. So let me ask you this personal question now. Are you in a love relationship with the master? I really do believe, as we said a moment ago, that if we love Jesus Christ with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, then obedience isn't a problem. The other side of the coin is, 
You know, if we really don't love him, even though we may say that we do, it may be hard to obey him. So ask yourself this question. Have you surrendered yourself wholly and totally to the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? Have you entered into a love relationship with Jesus Christ? Have you surrendered your will to him and said, Lord Jesus, you're in control of everything, my finances, the way I conduct myself publicly, how I raise my family, where I work, who my friends are. You see, if you're in a love relationship with him, you recognize that he's the master, you're the servant, and you do what he expects. This is a time in our service where we ask you to stand right now. We're going to ask you to stand and consider the decision that Jesus Christ may be asking you to make here this morning. And it's very possible that you're here today and you realize that it's time for you to surrender your life to Jesus Christ. To allow Him to be your master. To enter into that relationship of love that He has for you. You see, as we said earlier, Jesus went to the cross... For the sake of lost people. So that people like you and me can be saved. Why did he do that? Because he loves us. And he's waiting right now for you to accept his offer. To enter into a loving relationship with him. Do you sense the Holy Spirit speaking to your heart on the inside? Asking you to do that? I realize if you are, you may be saying, but I've got an awful lot of questions. I'm not sure what that means. I understand that. But if you're sensing that tug upon your heart to make that decision, I would encourage you to make that decision today. When we sing this hymn of invitation to come forward, talk to me, talk to Kevin. We'll talk about the other questions that you may have. But what's important is that you respond to the Holy Spirit who's speaking to you right now. Maybe you're a believer already, but God has spoken to you about your relationship with Christ. And maybe you've kind of succumbed to that fake news idea of stewardship where you've allowed your own sense of conservatism to override what the Bible says. Maybe you need to confess that and repent of that and say, Lord, help me to be the kind of steward that invests in your kingdom.